My name is Angelo Lopez. I am the editorial cartoonist for the Philippine News Today, a Filipino-American community newspaper in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm talking to Cullum Rogers. He's a retired editorial cartoonist. Is that right? Yes, a uh, retired political cartoonist. I'm still doing a few freelance jobs, okay. but not political. <clears throat> okay. And you're based in Durham, um, North Carolina. You started doing cartoons in 1977 with the Durham Morning Herald. That was the first place I sold a cartoon for money. I actually did uh, cartoons for the college paper while oh, I was okay. at Davidson College. Okay. Uh, class That's... of 71. <clears throat> oh, cool. Cool. And you've been um, uh, from 1997 to 2018, when you retired, you did editorial cartoons for the Independent Weekly based in Durham, right? I did. And, you, and you've been, uh, since 1980, you've been a member of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. That's correct. <clears throat> oh, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. I am very honored to have you um, come in, I, I guess, to show off your new beard and mustache, I guess. Oh, well, that's it. That's it. The new beard. Yes. <laughs> I can leave and just leave it here, you know. You know <laughs> the beard. There you are. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, you know, I, I've been asking all um, in my previous cartoonist talks, I've been asking everybody since the pandemic has been such a unique time and stuff I, I thought i'd ask everybody because you know i've been talking to cartoonists from different parts of the country right yeah so i'm right. curious with you um how has the past three years in the pandemic affected you personally and how has it affected your community in durham north carolina well that is that is hard to, in a way that's hard to say but of course of course <clears throat> sorry the first thing the pandemic does is drive you indoors where you don't yeah. see anybody so yeah. it's hard to tell how anything affects a community when the first thing it does is drive you apart. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that's uh, true. I've noticed it reinforced a lot of my bad habits. Being a cartoonist, I've got bad habits anyway, such as staying up late and sleeping late and sticking to myself, <laughs> you know, and going into a room by myself and muttering and working and not coming out. All yeah. these things that uh, the pandemic seemed to encourage. Yeah. So it, 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 I said at one point that it seems to have turned everybody into cartoonists because oh, okay. now we're all working out of our houses and we don't have a regular income and we're wondering what we're going to do and it's uh, no, no set schedule anymore. Uh -huh. uh, so it basically leaned into my regular schedule that way. It, it is, I've noticed you know, a lot of pickups. I mean, Durham is a college community. It's a very tech savvy community. So we did some quick switching over. I mean, the restaurants were impacted very big by the pandemic and they quickly learned how to switch over to the kind of delivery, hybrid delivery in-house, depending on what the weather is or what the uh, medical situation is, conditions. So I think Durham has adapted pretty well to the pandemic. People okay. get their shots around here. Uh, the community seems to be coming back now that it's 2022. Yeah. Events are coming on again. I mean, we just had our first political cartoonist convention the AAEC had its first meeting since 2019, just recently uh, in Columbus, Ohio. So did and you did you attend? Did you? I attend? did attend. I went to that, and uh, we had a very small turnout of cartoonists. There were something like 30 or so members of the association there. Yeah, uh, I want to apologize for that. <laughs> I was, no, I was planning not, it's a... all your fault. You would have no, no. <laughs> 40 more people if you'd shown up. <laughs> yeah, I was planning on going, but my father-in-law started having some health problems, so I had to help oh. my wife mm -hmm. take care of my, my in-laws and stuff. And oh, my nan, yeah. my my mom just passed away last year, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So I I I, I was I, you know, I was planning on going a couple I, I was kind of sure of going, but then um I kind of got swamped with these kind of health problems with my in-laws and my um, helping mm -hmm. my dad. So that I can't, but I'm thinking next year's when it's in Montreal. Uh, it will be probably Montreal. It looks like exactly when the only thing they're saying so far is early May. So mm -hmm. okay. circle that loosely on your calendar. Okay. I'll, I'll try to go because I, I want, I really want, cause I've never been to the Billy Ireland museum and stuff and oh, I, I was dying to go you yeah you've got to get there sometime i mean at one of course they have the the cartoon crossroads columbus festival there in Ohio, at columbus every year yeah. so that will be around next year if you feel okay. like making two trips one to the aac and one to the billy ireland in october you can do that 
Yeah, I'll, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll it's try. probably worth seeing uh, any time of year. You hardly, you don't really need a, a cartoonist convention to make it worthwhile to visit. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. I've, like I said, I've never visited, but I've been dying to visit for years now. Ever since I found out about it and stuff, yes. I, I would be, I would love to see some of those uh, originals and stuff. It would be mm -hmm. cool. Oh, it's a, it's a great place, museum and library. I just donated, uh, brought them two two hundred and fifty books I carried up to Ohio State. Uh, oh. Just this just this uh, past month for the during the convention to uh, give to their to the Ireland Library. It turned out I'm comparing my library, which has about four hundred four thousand or so cartoon books in it, and oh, the cool. Billy Ireland Library has about forty five thousand cartoon books in it. But oh. I still found several hundred they didn't have that I had, and I'm going to keep going through. And I should end up giving them about eight hundred or so books over the next year. Yeah, you're sort of like Jefferson, you know, I think when yeah. the Library of Congress, you know, when the library, I guess who was first started Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson donated most of his books and stuff. Right. To, to that's, that was one of the starts of it. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, maybe they'll maybe they'll change the Billy Ireland to me if, you know, I give them something equal to maybe one tenth of one percent of their old stock. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll get a chair with my name on the plaque. On the oh, plaque, OK. Something like that. <laughs> Well, when oh, I when I, I visit when, when I finally do visit, I'm, I'm going to suggest that to them. So. Yeah, sit, sit, yeah, say you want to sit in the B.C. Rogers Memorial Wooden Library Chair. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you you've been a cartoonist now since 70, 1977, right? Right. And, yeah. Um, you've been covering the Durham, North Carolina community since then. I'm I'm curious, what what's that been like, and 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 how did you become a cartoonist? <clears throat> well, I've been <clears throat> sorry, I don't know what. No, dear, I better drink water. <clears throat> no, no, that's okay. I have some coffee with me, too, so. <clears throat> Help yourself. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, I, as I say, I was always a kid who played with pencils and paper. Uh, I, I mean, starting way back, like childhood starting. Uh, I, I drew pictures as a small child. My mother even saved. I have somewhere a fake newspaper front page. I made up with pencil and paper on a piece of notebook paper oh, for yeah. us. One of those, you know, dog escapes yard kind of family news things. So yeah. I was interested in uh, in the press, journalism, magazines, things like that from a very early age. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, when I was about 10 years old, I discovered Mad Magazine, which oh. was just, you know, a direct shot into the veins of anybody who had that kind of humor slash cartooning slash media yeah. Uh, politics interest it just hit the sweet spot and that probably helped uh helped determine my fate a little bit i uh -huh. mean i was the kid in the second grade class who drew more often than anybody else i don't know if i drew better but i drew more uh -huh. than anybody else did and uh most people who were the best kid in the second grade class for drawing cartoons don't keep at it and uh -huh. i did keep at it uh -huh. i think part part of it it's it's that I've talked with other cartoonists about it, and we all seem to have this interesting combination of huge interest in cartooning and huge ignorance about exactly what in, what's involved in getting paid to do it. <laughs> getting a job doing it, you know? It, it's uh, One of those you cartoonists. Have, yeah, you, you have to be interested enough in it to want it, but not interested enough in it to know you're no good yet. You know? yeah, so yeah. It, it's almost a catch-22 that keeps people out of it. Yeah, but if you if for some reason you're interested in cartooning and you don't know you're no good at it, you keep doing it. Yeah, and you get in your school paper, you get in the high school paper or the college paper, and after a while, you start thinking. When you start thinking about jobs, you know what do I want to do with myself? And in my own case, I said I realized well the only two things I want to do are acting and drawing cartoons, neither mm -hmm. of which are the greatest you know pathway to riches and and success and fame. Yeah. Or even just, a, well, they're, they're great pathways to riches and fame. They're lousy pathways to a comfortable middle class income. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I had to settle for what fame and riches I've gotten so far and uh, forego the middle class income. But I kept at it for 40 years oh. and managed to survive. And I did what I wanted to do. I'm still doing what I want to do, which is a great thing to be able to say. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's what I think. I used to I used to think the same thing coming out of college mm -hmm. was that I, I wanted because I was thinking peanuts, right? Charles Schultz. Right, yeah, Charles Schultz. I was hoping that kind of fame, but that never happened. But <laughs> I think I've come to the point in my life where as long as I'm doing what I like to do, mm -hmm. that stuff, and as long as I have some sort of um, you know, um, you know, I can pay the rent, I can right, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing because like I, I've really think you know, you know, my cartoons have not been in mailbox in lunch boxes right yeah, like yeah. that but I, i've had it i've had a i'm happy with my life uh -huh. so, there's a great uh one of the well nobody the only person who i think ever made charles schultz money from cartooning was charles schultz maybe walt did <laughs> made you know charles schultz money from it but yeah, uh yeah. there's some joke i was uh, i think it was bill Keane who used to MC all the national cartoonist society banquets just because of his sense of humor the guy who did the family circus Apparently yeah. had a great mean sense of humor when he wasn't drawing his nice, you know, family oriented family comedy strip. Oh, yeah. I'm surprised yeah. because he's it's such a gentle strip. It's a gentle strip. But he, he had a nice he, I mean, he had a cutting wit to him. He, he once uh, introduced Charles Schultz by saying that he was the only man who was so rich he had to microfilm his money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> yeah yeah well but uh, yeah that 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 is certainly the the brass ring that people want it, it, when you think cartoonist you think i've got a comic strip i can draw what i want it's in every newspaper in the world and i'm rolling in money from it yeah, Which, yeah. you know it's just well it's it's the dream you know yeah. it's one version of the dream yeah, that was sort of my dream and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more comic strips. I I I came I came into political cartooning by accident and stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, it's okay. I I I when once I it, it's sort of like a drug. Once you start doing political cart cartoons, mm -hmm. you just you just fall in love with it. And stuff, so. It is. It's the most. Uh, uh, it it's the the most unlimited. Kevin Callagher, who is the cartoonist, is the Baltimore Sun, the Economist. Cartoon. Yeah, yeah. I met him once. He's a nice yes. guy. That guy, excellent caricatures, but he has kind of his thirty-minute talk he can give to the the pub, the groups when he goes to speak. And oh. basically, his talk is: here is why political cartooning is the best kind of cartooning in the entire world. And the reasons are that you can do any kind of cartoon in it. If you want to do a six-panel strip one day, you can do it. If you want to do a caricature of someone that is basically a you know a, a warts and all headshot of somebody with a one-line caption to it you can do that if you want to tell a continuing story you can use you can make up characters to interact with your with the real people from real life you know you can have your joe public kind of characters they can yeah. interact with the presidents and kings of the world and uh so there's there's really if you want to do any kind of cartooning in the world you can do it within political cartooning yeah whereas in the flexible, others you're sort of yeah. locked into a box you know if you're if you're doing a strip well, this is these are your characters. You can't suddenly introduce a whole new set of people or talk about a completely different subject. But with this, mm -hmm. you, it's you know the I like I liked one of the things I liked about political cartooning was the fact that you had to do something different, but in a way you had to do the same thing, because you had a space you had to fill, had to do the stuff you had to do something different, but it had to look like the same you know the same person doing something else. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it gave you a chance to do a variety of things. I think I would just, I believe, I found out over the course of my years that I was unsuited for repetitive, mindless labor, uh, unless I, you know, all the time. If I can switch to something else, I can do anything boring and repetitive as long as I don't have to do just that. Yeah, I you do did it for an it for hour and do something years. else for an hour. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you did it for 41 years, so that's pretty Yeah, cool. pretty much. Yeah, with a lot of time off for sleeping late and wondering where the next job was coming from. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, as I said, the hours were better than the pay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'm curious. You're a liberal. You know, would you consider yourself a liberal cartoonist? Oh, well, I, I consider myself a middle of the road Democrat, which these days, of course, is either considered wildly communistically far left uh, for most Republicans, or is just considered boring old middle of the road stuff if you're a leftist activist. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a. I might as well just admit I'm a Democrat. Okay. No, no, I'm a Democrat. Sure so no, 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 yeah. no apologies necessary. But, yeah. but you're a Democrat in a red state. I'm a Democrat in a blue area of a red state. So okay. you see, uh, it, it, it's within that. But Durham, uh, Durham is very much an urban area. It's the Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill area of North Carolina. All those cities are in three counties that are right next to each other. 
And so it's like a 25 mile drive from here to Raleigh and 12 miles from here to Chapel Hill. It's oh, not okay. like it's across the edge. It's basically the one place, these oh, okay. points, it's a metropolitan area. Oh, and okay. uh, it is uh, the, the most democratic area in the state, I think, as far as numbers and percentages, oh, okay. uh, which is interesting. But the cities in, in North Carolina tend to vote Democratic and the rural areas tend to vote Republican. And uh, Durham, uh, North Carolina these days is about half and half. So it's one. it's become a swing state. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um... Because because you have that kind of insight, being in a um, mm -hmm. I guess a blue bubble in a red state. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I'm a California liberal, but I, yeah. I used to have conservative friends, mm -hmm. and in the past twenty years, um, you know, I've I've just been in some crazy conflicts, and I've lost uh -huh. people who used to be close friends. And stuff. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm I'm curious with you. I mean, have you had similar experiences, or how how how? And I, I guess for the larger question. Um, because this has such, been such a partisan time, do you have any um, insights on in how we can um, kind of bridge that kind of partisan divide? Or is that just, you know, I, I've asked other cartoonists and they, they have no answers, <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering uh, well, if you have like any ideas. Yeah, I, 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 well, I'm not sure how it, I mean, there's kind of always been that gap between uh moderate left and far right in this country. I mean, that goes back to at least the New Deal and yeah. Roosevelt coming along. And it, or it might go back to Theodore Roosevelt coming along. He knew oh, yeah, because he was a progressive Republican, Republican Party right? once. Yeah. Well, yeah, there, I mean, it, uh, and I can, I'm old enough to remember back in the, well, not quite remember, but having read stuff from the 50s and 60s uh, and, and late, early 50s and mid 50s, uh, before I started getting interested in politics. I've been following it personally since the Johnson-Goldwater race back in 1964. Yeah. Uh, that, that was the first race I actually sat down with the newspaper and clipped out. I, got, I had this great idea, you know, I was 13, 14 years old. I'm going to clip out every story in the paper about the presidential election, and then I'm going to have a scrap book on it, you know? <laughs> there were an awful lot of stories about a presidential election and a presidential yeah. election here, and just one newspaper, you know? <laughs> So yeah. I, I, I think I abandoned that around April or something, but I still was always interested in following presidential elections. And that led to more of an interest in politics and of course, political cartooning. Because um, that's, that's, that's what, that was the visuals in, in presidential elections for years. Oh, okay. So since CTV, Johnson, mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, I, I guess when I think about that elections, you know, at that time, Goldwater was considered really far right. But if you look at him now, mm -hmm. he seems pretty moderate. And stuff if you compare him to today's is you know Paul you know today's right. pardon you know mm -hmm. he seems rather moderate compared to like um Marjorie I forget her last Marjorie name Taylor Green. Green. I yeah think or... see Marjorie compared to her you know uh Marjorie Taylor Green 10 years ago is probably moderate compared to Marjorie Taylor Green I'm not sure what her history is but she oh. seems to be going uh further toward crazy rather than further away from it as yeah. time passes yeah. But uh, there, I mean, there was, I remember uh, reading in, in Newsweek back in 64, somebody was reviewing a Republican delegate, you know, a Goldwater delegate to the 1964 convention who yeah. was convinced that Richard Nixon was a communist, you know, uh -huh. and just because he worked for Dwight Eisenhower. And the John Birchers was saying, you know, Eisenhower was a conscience agent of the communist conspiracy. Yeah. There's always been that section of the public for of the, the for years it was split between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party because the Democrats had all these nice white Southern segregationists yeah. in, you know and from basically yeah. the Civil War through the 1940s into the 50s was when that coalition started breaking up yeah. and uh, so but they they were never on the same side yeah. and now I think we've reached a point where after all the 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 Southern segregation vote or to sum it up roughly, switched over to the Republicans with Goldwater and Nixon and Reagan during the 60s and 70s. So now you had the old fashioned sort of John Birch, Midwestern isolationist, all foreigners are evil, uh, mixed with the uh, all American Southern, black people are evil group. Yeah. And so, so you, now you have a sort of uh, foreigners and black people are evil lump in one yeah. place, which, which you didn't have before. And so, I mean, it's not so much an increase in the number of people who are awful racist bigots or whatever. It's just simply that they, in a literal sense, got their acts together. 
uh, uh, with each other and found a political party that would put up with them. Yeah. And uh, that is, that's what's happened within the Republicans. It's just uh, moving more and more, more and more toward satisfying popular demand. I think part of that is because just that politics, partisan politics has become this constant 24 hour a day, 365 days a year uh, event that you can follow on and catch at highest emotional pitch. I mean, there used to be a, a a pattern to it. You'd have a presidential election and the interest in politics would go up and up and up and up until you reached election day when everybody in the country was convinced that, an, oh God, unless my guy wins, it's gonna be you know doomed to the world. Yeah. And then the election would be over, doom didn't happen. People lost interest in politics and most people lost interest in it for about three and a half years. Yeah, uh, you know, because the the drop in midterm election turnout and local election turnout was always lower than national, and people could sort of decompress. If yeah. you probably pinned them down in a chair and interrogated them about their politics, you could have gotten them back up to the same pitch they were on an election day. But it it didn't normally happen, and now, television being television, the cycle is just mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. The high level of political blather, and if you have an interest in it. You know, you can satisfy that injustice. And if it makes you feel good to get a mad on at the people you don't like in politics, you can get that little feeling good, get a mad on feeling. But it's like any other drug. Eventually, you need stronger doses. Uh, it gets bad for you. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've discovered that basically the only difference between a harmful drug and a harmless drug is that the harmful drug wears off and you need more of it to get the same effect. And eventually you need the same effect just to function. Yeah. As, as an adult person without getting any high at all out of it. I speak from uh, experience as an alcoholic in that oh, line. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, I, I've discovered the same thing with television and other, I mean, reading internet comments. I can get sucked into, you've you ever gotten sucked into one of those holes where you've read a story on the internet and you start reading comments and you keep reading the comments for what seems like hours, even though after a while they're all in a pattern. Yeah. You know, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> cartoons are good for sucking people in and cartoons the internet is good for sucking people into that yeah uh, I, I i broke out of that because um mm -hmm. I, you know i i noticed it had an effect on me right. and stuff, you know and i just i right. just i you know i'm trying to get out of that idea where you you know like you know um even though i'm liberal i i, mm -hmm. I know that being stuck in a liberal outrage bubble is just mm -hmm. as unhealthy as being stuck in the conservative outrage bubble right, yeah. and stuff. And so I, I don't want to be mad that much, mm -hmm. stuff, you know, because it's not good for my mental health. Yeah. Well, it used to be that even if you wanted to, you could only watch news on television about an hour and a half a day, yeah. you know, early morning, noon, evening news, maybe, yeah. maybe three hours total if you watched all the local news and all the national news that showed up in your television set. But in general, people watch news for about an hour a day. And I really think that as far as input from television of what's going on in the world, an hour a day is the maximum you need to spend. Yeah, yeah uh, I think and that's right. You're, right, and if you're having the television news on for six hours a day, it's unhealthy. It's like you know sleeping eighteen hours a day or spending six hours a day at the table eating. It's yeah. just the wrong proportion to maintain a, a balanced life. Yeah, yeah, because I noticed that with Fox News and stuff yeah. that you know, um, you know, I, I still have. A few conservative friends, but I'm always mm -hmm. concerned about their overconsumption of Fox News because it seemed like they're disinterested in 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 what from one outrage to another and, mm -hmm. and keeping that love. You know, you were mentioning that keeping that right, yeah, well, outrage, and it becomes yeah. difficult to talk to them because yeah. they they see me as this caricature that Fox News paints all Democrats as being, uh -huh. and it's yeah. difficult. And they stop seeing me as a human being. Right. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that and that is the main thing. I, I really do think a, a lot of that uh, really Gingrich really weaponized New Gingrich back in the yeah. early 70s when uh, television came to Congress. Congress that, uh, that's another thing. Once you have a 24 hour showing what Congress is doing channel on yeah. television, it's, it's more politics. That is a, is a public service thing, because at least it has the the uh, the realism of being dull to yeah. it. Uh, you're you're talking about C-SPAN, right? You're talking yeah, about C-SPAN. Yeah, C-SPAN, okay. things like that. Be, yeah. uh, one of my, beware of political news that isn't slightly dull. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, there's got to be something sort of boring and permanent and 
uh, oh my God, this is a situation that looks like it's tied in a knot. And yeah. I would have to study this for some time to figure out what the hell to do about it. Yeah. It's really the attitude people should have toward almost any problem they hit, especially yeah. in politics, because things don't become political problems unless people can't solve them easily. Yeah, because yeah. I, I notice I with fellow progressives who used to have mm. conservative friends and yeah. you know family members. I think mm. I think you're right. They also blame a lot. You know, I blame Newt Gingrich. I notice a change yeah. around that time, and a, a lot of my mm. progressive friends who had conservative friends. Yeah, mm. you know they they also they also kind of pinpointed to Gingrich and stuff. So mm. is he from your area? I, I forgot. Oh, well, he's from Georgia, so that's from two Georgia, states okay. away. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. That's quite all right. But uh got South Carolina, all of South Carolina between me and Newt Gingrich. So that's a good a good buffer. Uh okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm I'm curious. Um when I first went to the AAEC conventions mm -hmm. and stuff, when was that? Um, when did you first go? Yeah, I think I met you at the uh Portland, I guess. Portland, uh, Oregon, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you were very friendly to me and welcoming to me. And I just wanted to tell you personally, I really appreciated it and stuff. Thank well, you thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah. And, and when we went, and you, I think from the very beginning, you started recommending cartoonists for me mm -hmm. to look at and stuff. Um, so I, I learned that I got this book. You see the Let's... masses? I don't know if you see it. Oh, yeah. You, the, you the, recommended the... that book to me. Uh -huh. And um, I, I, I grew to really love the uh, cartoonist. Mm. The Masses is a socialist magazine from the early 20th century, and I grew to love the cartoonists in the Masses. Mm. Art Young, Boardman Robinson, George Bellows and stuff. Right. It had a huge influence. It has a continuing influence mm. on my cartoons. And you also recommended Daniel Fitzpatrick. You know, this, uh -huh. I don't know if oh, yeah, seen. because I recommended him because of the, uh, yeah. He'll yeah. come into focus eventually, the Grease Pencil School. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. Since you were working in, in uh, pencil, or yeah, look yeah. Like pencil to me. No, and same thing. Pen and ink, but also I used the mm. Grease Pencil. But right. I loved it and stuff. And I, I want to thank you. I, I, St. Louis, I guess. I, when I look mm -hmm. at his stuff, I, I, I grew to love his stuff. I, I still look at his stuff now, and he has a big influence on me. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually think, uh, even though I like Herblock, I actually yeah. think Daniel Fitzpatrick, I like him better and stuff oh. so, but well, I, I still like her block because mm -hmm. but, um, I, I i actually kind of like fitzpatrick but I'm, I'm just curious how did you get into the um history of cartooning now, was that just a passion of yours from the very beginning or uh, almost from the very beginning i mean i of course when i was growing up every uh it was the, the height of the 10 cent comic book era you know or the okay. last days of the 10 cent comic book era in the 1950s yeah uh, and I, I my uncle i had an uncle who uh, worked for a while as at Dell Publishing uh, oh. for years after World War II, and he would come down to South Carolina to visit. Okay. Uh, and uh, bring. I, no, I forgot. What did Dell publish again? Was it Donald Duck? I guess. Or? Donald Duck did the Disney comics. Okay, uh, so did, did, he did Carl comics. Barks, right? Right, Carl Barks and oh, the okay. Uncle Scrooge stories and uh, Mickey Mouse and the. And that was when, if you got about twice or three or four times a year, they would put out a big eighty-page, twenty-five cent comic book. Oh, okay. <laughs> be, you know, a new adventure, and the, the, the characters would go on one of those long Carl Barks type Uncle Scrooge adventures in the eighty-page comic book. Yeah, so a close friend cool. of mine is starting to. Um, he he gave me as a gift a Carl Barks Donald Duck, and I'm I'm, oh, I'm yeah. I've always liked him and stuff, but I uh -huh. never had much exposure to him and stuff. Right. So this is the first time I'm getting a lot of exposure to his comics and stuff because mm -hmm. of that gift, and I, I love Carl Barks. Oh yeah, stuff. yeah. I mean, he, he's really a storyteller. That's what he is more. Uh, I mean, as much as as good as he is as an illustrator, I think he's even better as just simply coming up with stories and telling them. I oh. still remember reading about Donald and Uncle, you know, Uncle Scrooge wants to find out who's the richest man in the world. And he there's a South African multi-zillionaire named Flintheart Glomgold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Scrooge McDuck versus Flintheart Glomgold. And they end up unrolling. It turns out they're exactly tied. Except for who, which one, they have to determine which one has the largest ball of string. Uh -huh. And they determine that by unrolling their balls of string, starting at the top end of Africa and unrolling them down to the tip. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the adventure. So, you yeah. know, a story like that, I couldn't, I couldn't invent that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you started, I, I guess you, you said you were going to donate all your books to the um, uh, Bailey Island Museum. And right. you said you have 4,000 books. 4,000 4, plus, 4,100 and something cartoon books. 
That uh -huh. is just uh, most about two thousand of them are political cartoon related uh -huh. books, and the okay. others are uh, gag cartoons, strip cartoons, cartooning in general, caricatures. Uh -huh. So, uh, but I'm giving them. I was going to give them everything. It turns out that uh, they really only want the books they don't have. Oh, okay. Which makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. that's about uh, just judging from what I've done so far. That's about a fifth of the total, maybe, oh, okay. of my books. So it'll be I'll end up giving them around a thousand or so books. Oh. Where'd you get the books? Did you just crown shoe used bookstores? I'm buying them over the years, used bookstores. I, every every time I would go to a different city for a cartoonist convention or any other reasons, I would try to hit the used bookstores, see what uh, they had in the way of local cartoons. Because yeah, you see, yeah, yeah. You know, local. If you're a local cartoonist, you're really only going to sell books if you put out a book in the area where your cartoons are seen yeah. and distributed. So it's you know, a, somebody will print up a book and sell a couple of thousand copies in their home state. And uh -huh. it won't appear anywhere else. And so I go to their home state and rummage around the back corners of the used bookstores. And I find uh -huh. these things. And you yeah. do that for 40 something years and you end up with the, a hell of a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm a similar thing. I'm, I'm, I think I'm like you. I'm sort of a comics nerd, but, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I, I don't have anywhere near as many books as you do. But I, I do the same. I just grounds through used bookstores. Did you, have you gone in Portland? I forget the name of the store. Powell's. Oh, uh, have Powell's, you gone to Powell's? Yes. I went to, when I was at the Portland convention, I went to Powell's. I believe I went to something like three of the four days I was there. Yeah, involved yeah, a trip yeah. To Powell's, where yeah. I would, and I think all, all three times I walked out with about as much as I could lift. It's uh -huh. a wonderful bookstore. Yeah, but yeah. I think over the course of three days, I might have bought everything in it that I really, really wanted. Okay, you know, about a stack that tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know my 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 uh, computer says that we have six minutes for this meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I you know after around six minutes, I, I I'll I'll download this particular meeting and I, yeah. we can do the second link and stuff. But, okay, great. Let me ask you something. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, cartoons and stuff. Who are your heroes and who are your influences on your particular cartooning style? My style. Well, uh, the the first influence I, I was recognizing as an influence. I mean, when I started drawing cartoons, you don't know what's, what to do. God, I, I cannot even put my mind back to the point where I knew so as little about cartooning as I knew when I was starting to draw them in college. Yeah. But one of my first introduction to college was a book of Bill Malden's cartoons. Oh, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, in the, yeah. the library at, in my hometown, uh, uh, Bennettsville, South Carolina, in the high school library. It was uh -huh. the only book of political cartoons they had. And it was fairly recent. It was a 1961 collection of Malden's. I think it's, it was uh, uh, What's Got Your Backup. Oh, OK. Was, was the that the year he won the Pulitzer? That was 1961, and it was uh, not the year he won the Pulitzer, but uh, oh. he, had, he won it in 45, and he won it again shortly after he came back to cartooning, okay. uh, which was in 58, 59. I think he won the 59 Pulitzer. Okay, because okay, uh, I know it was close to 61 and stuff. Mm -hmm. right? it, was, it was around then. It was either late 60s or, or early, uh, eight, eight, late 50s, early 60s. He won his second Pulitzer. Yeah. Yeah. I only know Malden because of those World War II cartoons, the, the soldier ones. I forget right, the name the of Right, the Willie them. and Joe cartoons. Yeah. You should look up his, uh, his, uh, his the cartoons. He, two, two interesting books of Malden cartoons are, are Back Home, which is the sequel to Up Front. Back oh, Home okay. was a book he wrote after the war, like 1947-8. And it's one of the great return stories from World War II uh, soldier oh. books. I mean, yeah, if people yeah. had sort of forgotten that the immediate post-World War II period was not the fifth, the Eisenhower 50s. It was the early Truman 40s and the worrying about Stalin, worrying about the bomb, yeah. uh, worrying about whether China would go communist. The, the That late 40s uneasy period, are we going to have a depression after the war? What will we do with all these demobilized soldiers? Those yeah. kinds of uh, questions that because they got solved fairly quickly ended up being forgotten. Yeah. But it was a quite uneasy time in 46, 47, 48. And um, uh, Malden's book, uh, Back Home, very much reflects that. Yeah. Uh, I read a comic history. He was pretty brave. Mm -hmm. he, he was, uh, he seemed kind of fearless in, in his own way. I mean, yeah, just uh, flying planes. Anybody who fly an airplane is brave by my standards. <laughs> I can barely be a passenger, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was, he was, his, he was contrary. Uh, and that's what car editorial cartoonists tend to be. Yeah, they yeah. want to go their own way, 
don't don't want to take much direction. Oh. Uh, mm. oh, okay. Ooh, did you have other heroes or uh, other heroes? Well, my uncle Chuck was uh, someone who gave me a lot of. Once I did, for some reason, this is how funny the way the brain works. I had an uncle who was a, success, a successful cartoonist in oh. New York. Uh, was a cartoonist for the New Yorker. Did oh. cover for them. Did the did the whole bit. Uh, and he became my uncle by marrying my father's sister. So there wasn't a, you know, there was no genetic inheritance there of cartooning oh. talent, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, he still, you know, that's that counts as an uncle, you know. And uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, when I started getting interested in cartooning and started freelancing with the Herald, I sent him some of my early works and he sent me advice and gave me advice about it. And oh, the advice yeah. basically was learn to draw. Oh, okay. What's his name? Uh, Charles Saxon was his name. Oh, if you ever see any New Yorker cartoons, John, assigned Saxon, S A X O N. Did he do uh, kind of a thick pencil style? Yes, yeah. it was very much a thick pencil style. I think style. I remember him. Yeah, because right, of, yes. I, I have a book of the, the New Yorker and stuff mm -hmm. that somebody gave me as a gift. And yeah. the history of the New York. And I think I've seen some of his cartoons. Oh, that's good. So you're, you're sort of, he's your uncle. That's cool. Yeah, he was, uh, he died. Oh, 1988 he died so it's been a while uh, but uh he was uh very big with the new yorker in uh in the 60s through the 80s okay. uh, and he worked he also as i say that was the uncle who worked for dell publishing and used to bring me comics as a matter of fact for a short time in the 50s for like uh, two years in the mid 50s he was editor of modern screen magazine the movie magazine Oh, okay. So if you ever wondered who were those people putting marilyn monroe and rita hayworth on the cover of magazines in the 50s that was my uncle. Didn't mm -hmm. like it. Didn't like being editor of a movie magazine. Wanted to be a cartoonist. Oh, and so okay. he just said, I'm, I'm going to make myself a cartoonist. I'm going to make myself a New Yorker cartoonist. Oh, and he did. That's, a, that's and, a good role model for you to it go It is. For. It was a good role model. But again, I didn't really start using him as a role model until after I had begun drawing and publishing cartoons in the Durham Herald. Oh, uh, it, okay. it took that to make me realize, you know, I better learn something about this before I uh, disgrace myself with how horrible I am in print here. <laughs> I, mean, well, uh, no, I, I look at your cartoon. You, you, I love your cartoons and stuff. They, they, it has a wonderful loose style and stuff. So well, I, it, it took me uh, 30 something years to develop that wonderful loose style out of my terrible stiff style that I started with. Oh, okay. I mean, I tried, I, I you have to, I had to discover that, no, I'm not a crow quill person. I don't, I'm not a person who dips a pen in a bottle of ink. You know, those, those croquil, you ever tried working with croquil pens? Oh, no, that's me. I'm, yeah, I'm that's a you. You're a croquil person. Yeah. I never could get it. You know, they'd splatter and they do all these little Ralph Steadman effects that I didn't want. <laughs> Ralph Steadman does want them, the little splatter of ink on the page in yeah, just yeah. the right place. I would put the splatter of ink right where, but always end up right where somebody's eyeball was supposed to be, <laughs> you know, ruin the picture. Oh, but okay. uh, I, eventually went back to where I started. I, I, like almost every cartoonist, I started using a standard old number two pencil on a piece of, you know, notebook paper with the blue lines across it and the three holes running oh, okay. down the side, uh, okay. school paper. And oh, I ended cool. up being somebody who drew in pencils on standard typing paper. You, you talked a little bit about your process, but before I, before we go on to that, um, what are there, are there any other cartoonists that you admire and stuff? Or? Oh, well, the, uh, Harvey Kurtzman, of course, is way up there. He was uh -huh. the first editor of Mad, uh, and that is mainly the early Mad magazine, you know, is uh, engraved on my heart, as it were, as a, as a cartoonist. Uh -huh. uh, and I still have, I, as a matter of fact, I have a complete run of the first 20 years of Mad magazine oh, in, cool. my, in my collection, 1952 through 1972. Every yeah. year. And uh, I will occasionally turn to that for inspiration and nostalgia. Yes, yeah, so it's like but Super Duper Man and Super uh, Duper Man, all the time. Annie, Annie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I started reading it, uh, yeah, fairly uh, well. It was 1960 when I started reading it, so it hadn't been a comic book for a while then. It was a magazine, but I've oh. discovered the comic book stuff from the paperback reprints, of oh, course, okay. that were coming out then. So, oh. Matt, Matt had a good way of keeping all of itself in print. They were wise, they knew how, how the only thing really a humor magazine has to sell is itself. Oh, you, know, yeah. you, you can't you can't be newsworthy or informative or useful or you know anything like that you just have to be funny yeah and so well maybe this joke will work again so put it in a paperback and sell it and then put it in an annual and sell that and then put it in a slicker annual and sell that yeah yeah 
you know, I'm glad that they're reprinting some of that stuff now because when I was a kid, you know, you go to the library and get those um, history of comics and stuff. You'd mm -hmm. see like you know, Super Duper Man or little Annie Fanny and stuff. Right. Like, you'd never see anything else and stuff until, mm -hmm. until um, you know, like um, recently when they started reprinting the entire runs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, Mad Men, it, it was an influence on me, but it was always the early issues with Kurtzman and Elder and all those mm -hmm. guys. It was kind of a myth. And yeah. Wall Wally Wood, because I, uh -huh. I, you're lucky that you saw the entire run of the early uh -huh. issues and stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I always envy you, you know, mm -hmm. envy, you know, people who saw the first run of those comics because it must have uh -huh. been like a revelation. Revelation. Well, of course, I wasn't seeing the first runs of the comics, but I was seeing uh, oh, uh, okay. the, the, the comic ended around 1955. Okay. So that's when the ma magazine started. So I was five years after that. But of course, you got to realize when you're a kid, uh, 1955, five years ago was half my life when I was, you know, first reading Mad Magazine. So the fact that it was a comic book six years in the past, you know, that was, that might have been the Punic Wars or something like that. It didn't really, it, it, it didn't mean, you know, oh, past, you know, uh, when you're a kid, the past is all the same distance. It's back there. Oh, and it doesn't okay. matter if it's the Civil War, or, you know, your grandmother's childhood or what. It was just, it's before you. And so I, I, I thought I was coming sort of late to MAD because, you know, it had done all these changes before. It had done all this stuff. This is when it was ten, less than 10 years old. And I was thinking, oh, I missed this when it was really good. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, it, 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 uh, it shaped me. And uh, the, 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 that whole Kurtzman style of storytelling, I mean, it, 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 you can see it in when I do, occasionally when I do panel cartoons, multi-panel things. There's a little bit of that MAD look that sneaks in. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. You know, just because of the the panels and boxes. Yeah, you know, I'm curious. Uh, David Cohen. I had a talk with him. He also introduced me to past cartoonists and stuff mm -hmm. like uh, David Lowe and Carl Goss. He right. mentioned a guy named Hugh Hugh Hi. I forget his name. Haney. Haney. Yes. Do you know? I mean, I I tried looking it up, and there's not really much on him and stuff. Do you like yeah. him? I like him a lot. There's I've got a a book of his. Let me go and grab this book. It's right here on this shelf, and I know exactly where it is. Oh, okay. Here is a book oh, of Hugh Haney's. Okay. This is the book. This is the only book he put out in his lifetime. Okay. And uh, there hasn't been a post posthumous collection. So this goes up to, this was published in 1964, just after Richard Nixon resigned as Gerald Ford, our most, the most recent president in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's Haney drawing himself. And but he, is he a, a traditional pen and ink cartoonist? Or? He is very much pen and ink. He, he, well, he, he once famously said that his goal was to think like Herb Locke and draw like Walt Kelly. Okay. <laughs> and you can see his style is a very, very much, let me pick a, a good uh, typical example here. Uh, a very, here's where you can see, definitely see some Herb, uh, the, the early Herb Locke influence okay. in Hugh Haney uh, from cartoons in the uh, Eisenhower administration. You see, okay. this is, that's a very Herb Lock looking cartoon. Yeah, it's I nice. Love. I love his. I love his. Uh -huh. I love his line. Right. It's more Herb Lock was working with a grease pencil, and Haney was working with a pen and ink or with a brush. Yeah. Actually. So that's all nice, slick, clear brush lines. Was he a Southern liberal cartoonist or Southern Southern liberal? Uh, he he uh, was in Louisville for most of his career. Uh, started out in Greensboro, North Carolina. Was there for several years in the mid fifties. Oh, okay. But uh, and he he got to a much uh, yeah here's a you can see how how he kept simplifying his style over oh, the years yeah, yeah. to get the uh, to get things that Vietnam that Lyndon Johnson is trying desperately to hold the country holding the U S together split by Vietnam that's a good cartoon but, yeah he was he was a good he was good in the he uh, <clears throat> he was one of the last of the people who was more likely to do a tall cartoon than a wide cartoon. Here's his oh, Richard Nixon coming that. back. Yeah, the, 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 again, that was the Herb Lock school, and that was the, the, the standard look of editorial cartoons uh, until Pat Oliphant came along in the 60s and started doing more horizontal stuff. He was preceded by oh. a few others. John Fischetti had done horizontal cartoons, but uh, that was the uh, English style, was the horizontal, and the American was more upright because the cartoon tended to be a figure, you know, oh. uh, yeah, tall. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I never noticed that. In stuff. Mm -hmm. so that's that's interesting to know. Okay. Right. Uh, Haney had a had a ta had a way of he he liked to draw full figures in his cartoons. You oh, know, okay. not just do somebody from the neck up kind of thing. Though he would do that. And when you do that, sometimes the uh, the tall format works better. 
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, for it's it's more portrait. And again, it's portrait like as opposed to landscape. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to look because I have a, I have an Oliphant collection. I have a yeah. um, Herblock collection. I'm, and yeah. I'm curious now to see, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, if you look at it. I, mean, I never thought about like, it, but now that you mentioned it, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, her, Herblock's tendency. I mean, we all have our sort of patterns that we fall into or ways we tend to see see our drawings. Yeah. And Herblock's tends to be focused on a person. Yeah. Yeah. And Oliphant's tend to be focused on a place, a setting, a scene with a bunch uh -huh. of people in it. Which and so it's de definitely the difference between a, a portrait frame and a movie a movie camera screen, and okay. you can see that when you look at them. And Oliphant brought a lot of that cinematic quality, uh, even oh. though he was not raised in America. He 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 brought in the some that, that mad like humor into oh. political cartooning. Fifties yeah, yeah. political cartooning tended to be fairly serious. You know the symbolic the dove of peace and the atom bomb in this desperate struggle. And uh, yeah. the editorials were serious, so the editorial cartoons were serious, maybe with a bit of a joke in them or just the drawing itself was funny, but the message was, you know, this is good, this is bad. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Oliphant and um, later Jeff McNelly really helped bring in the this is weird school of uh, commentary. <laughs> 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 Never mind whether it's good or bad, this is funny looking. You know, oh, this, this okay. is, this is okay. weird. Yeah, I and, never noticed that. Yeah. Well, you can see it if you look in the past, even the with Thomas Nast and Joseph Kepler, who was his chief rival in the 19th mm -hmm. century. You had Nast, who was black and white, pen and ink, hard hitting, you know, yeah. anti Southern, anti Confederate, uh, pro 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 uh, freedom for blacks. Just just very much a political a political political cartoonist. Yeah. And Kepler came along. And he tended to turn his characters into circus clowns and zanies and paint them up. And uh, yeah. it was a performance. I mean, he was, an, he was a cartoonist, political yeah. cartoonist. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to I'm look old. up Kepler's, because like, I know yeah. Nass, but I don't yeah. know Kepler's very well. If, if, he, he's, he's available online. There's some good books about him, but just Joseph Kepler cartoons. Oh, uh, okay. He was at Puck magazine. He was the founder of Puck. As a matter oh, of fact, okay. uh, and that, that's one way of a cartoonist can be secure of a position in a magazine is to found the magazine himself. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you want a magazine, you whatever you want. Start it, you know? yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Nast had trouble working. He worked for the Harper Brothers for Harper's Weekly. Yeah. Uh, and they were always say, oh, those that that's too mean. Don't be so mean in this cartoon. And uh, he had real not, influence, though. He, he yeah, took he, down the Nast machine. Yeah, uh, we took down the tap. Oh, not the uh, tap. The tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the the boss Tweed. The Tweed. Tammany machine. Hall, I think, right? Yes, right. Tammany yeah. Hall and Boss Tweed. He, he he was the the visual part of that to, uh, team. The 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 New York Times did a lot. Uh, uh, may have even done more than Nass did as far as the actual nitty gritty work of establishing the facts uh, uh, about the, the corruption of the of uh, the Tweed ring. But it was Nass who gets in the books because he drew the pictures. And yeah. everybody would, you know, reprint a picture. Don't reprint a column of type. You're already writing a column of type. You yeah. know? So yeah. again, that, that's how you get the fame. Draw the pictures, draw pictures, be famous. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah. Now, you, you're mentioning, you know, something mm -hmm. that I wanted to ask about, you know, um, knowing the history of cartoons, you know, you mentioned how, how, how influential Nast was, right? Yes. Right. And, um, and how a, a couple of decades ago, cartoonists were very influential, right? So mm -hmm. uh, Walt Kelly and Herblock, they confronted Joe McCarthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In World War II, uh, you know, I, I read that um, if Germany was successful in invading England, one of the first people that um, Hitler wanted to go after was David Lowe, right? Right, he was because on the list. Yeah, because um, I guess Lowe's cartoons really got under Hitler's skin, right? So they, they I mean, did. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, um, you know, with the decline in newspapers the past maybe two decades, mm -hmm. how, how do you think political cartoons can have um, influence that, you know, they did uh, several decades ago? Well, uh, what is going on in the, the slow, messy process that nobody's planned and nobody's organizing it's just happening due to the economic changes yeah. is that uh newspapers can't afford to run cartoonists anymore newspapers basically almost can't afford to be newspapers anymore yeah. uh and that is that is unconnected with cartooning in a way but we were we were the canaries in the coal mine for that because if uh a newspaper is starting to have financial problems you look for places to cut 
the only two things you can cut on a newspaper are what you pay for paper and what you pay for staff. Um, I don't think, I don't know, how, maybe ink's gotten expensive too. I don't know, but uh, yeah. it used to be that the price of paper was the big factor. Uh, uh, and, but newspapers made money. They still make money some ways. They just don't make huge money. Uh, and uh, because the, the, uh, the classified ads have dried up. They, they've gone to Craigslist, things like that. Newspaper yeah. advertising is what has taken the huge hit. Yeah. Uh, and but some people are still, still still buying them and still reading them. But the editorial cartoon has got to disconnect itself from being thought of as this is a part of a newspaper because yeah. the newspaper has its own problems. Don't yeah. hitch yourself. You know, well, we are hitched to them. We, we, we grew out of the newspaper business like comic strips. Comic strips are having the same thing political cartoons had because even though political car political cartoons existed before, they were parts of newspapers. They were published separately. They were brought, you know, they were prints. You could buy a cartoon print of something yeah. and frame it and hang it in your house. Yeah, and so the British cart those British caricaturists in the, the British caricaturists, Gil Ray and those people in the 1780s and 90s, the Napoleonic yeah. era. When yeah. Britain was fighting France and you had a great enemy across the channel in Napoleon, that yeah. was one of the first great eras for political cartooning. Oh, that, so that was that, that had nothing to do with papers. That was prints. No, nothing to do with papers. That was prints. Oh, okay. Uh, I, didn't, you, I didn't know that. Just, I, I always assumed that it was part of the British rags and stuff. But you know, uh, no, the the British uh, the British newspaper existed before the British newspaper cartoon. Because oh. I, went, I went to uh, an exhibition, as a matter of fact, in London uh, in 1970 when I was over there. It was okay. put on by the British Cartooning Society at the National Portrait Gallery. And it was a history of the British newspaper cartoon, which, according oh. to them, dated to 1720. I'm not exactly I can't remember what got published in 1720 in some newspaper <laughs> you know, somewhere that counted yeah, as the yeah, first yeah. newspaper cartoon. But the newspapers themselves existed for about 100 years before then. Okay. And they just weren't illustrated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I know that some cartoonists are going on Instagram and they're getting mm -hmm. followings and stuff. I think from what I've heard and stuff, and, you know, it's not a big sampling, but, uh, you know, how do you, they, they're, they're happy that they're getting um, stuff on the internet. They just, mm -hmm. they're just trying to figure out how to monetize stuff. Right. The, uh, the, the monetizing it, well, that is the $64 question, you know, right there is how do you, how do you turn where do you put the meter on the on, on your computer on your on the screen how do you put the place where you drop the quarter in yeah or yeah. the penny in before you can see the cartoon and yeah. that would really be all it could take just some mechanism that say takes a tenth of a penny out of you know a website where you can look at all the cartoons you want to and it costs you a tenth of a penny per cartoon so you know you you can look at a thousand cartoons and spend a dollar yeah okay which okay. uh if you get thousands and millions of people looking at it, it's going to turn into real money yeah. eventually. Uh, okay. But I think there's going to be, I mean, ASCAP, when radio came along, the songwriters had the same, had a, really a problem like the cartoonists. Okay, there's this radio thing that's playing all our music that we put on records and they're not paying us for it. How do we, So they set up a royalty system with radios where if a radio wants to play music, a radio station wants to play music, they have to kick into this American Society of Composers, et cetera, ASCAP. Fund. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, so, a... yeah, you know, if you start a commercial radio station, you're not going to be spinning all these platters free. Uh, oh, now, okay. You know, okay. the college radio can, because college radio isn't ad supported, it isn't making money. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, but, but as soon as you start making money <laughs> off the radio, uh, okay. you have to start paying some of that money to the people who produce the content that you're putting on your radio. The people uh, who record, you know, Taylor Swift needs your money. That yeah, kind of thing. yeah. And no, I, really I actually don't mind that because mm -hmm. I, I noticed, I know that those rock and rollers, the early ones, most of them yeah. got gypped of their money, right? Oh, and sure. So, yeah, they they were, uh, they, they, they signed all sorts of bad contracts. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just saw the movie Elvis. See that if you. Oh yeah, it. yeah. I saw it. I saw yeah, the movie. We loved Elvis. it, but I didn't realize how how beholden Elvis was to Colonel Parker and stuff. And Colonel right. Parker yeah. really screwed Elvis and stuff. You well, know? That, that was that was big during their lifetimes. I mean, while the Elvis Par Colonel Parker relationship was going on, it was uh -huh. you know a known fact uh, in rock and roll that uh, Park Elvis is under Parker's thumb. And it would be uh, a shame he can't do this and that because the colonel won't let him. 
you know, yeah, I was kind of sad and stuff because yeah. I kept thinking like, you know, Elvis, Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. you know, Richard, they were such pioneers right. and stuff. And yet, um, mm -hmm. and yet financially they got screwed and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our American culture was a lot to all of them, right. you know, yeah. um, I, I know Fats Domino, like I, I know the mm -hmm. Beatles. You know, I'm a big Beatles fan, and I right. heard that when the Beatles met all of them and stuff, they were just in awe and stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, that that well, that was what that's what the Beatles were doing. They started out, you know, doing '50s American rock and roll in yeah. those cl clubs in you know Hamburg, yeah. uh, it was just uh, playing for the crowd and do that do that for two three years, and you get pretty good at keeping the beat. You know, like, <laughs> you know. Doug Marlett, the cartoonist, had a great line. He said, if you keep doing something, it's hard to get worse at it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's, well, you know, that's that, the story. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about, you know, you, your style, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned how you just persisted. I mean, I was just, I'm the same way and stuff. I just, yeah. you know, I'm not the best and I'm not the worst. But mm -hmm. if I, if you just don't stop. You eventually right. develop your own style, right? And stuff. Yeah, well, and you, you develop your own style, but what you also do, you develop an, an style is the absence of style. I mean, you know, that sounds like some Zen thing or something, but. And what do you mean uh, by that? I mean that your style is the way you draw when you're not thinking about how you're drawing. Oh, yeah. If yeah, you, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. say, see, you know, a, a funny looking dog walking down the street, and you got, I got to get a picture, I got to get a sketch of that funny looking dog. Uh -huh. And you just make a sketch of it for your own reference, you know, sort of to file away in your memory or because you remember things once you've sketched them or just because you've got a file at home that you put scraps of odd looking pieces of paper in. Uh -huh. uh, the way you are feeling when you're doing that, when you're not thinking about communicating it to anybody except yourself, is the way you want to draw. Uh, or yeah, is the way, yeah. or I, I, is the way. I haven't thought of it that way you said it and stuff, but yeah. I think you're right and stuff yeah, because it, in the beginning you're so self conscious mm -hmm, yeah, about trying to make, and trying to do something. How do I make the edge of this table straight? You know that is not how you find your style. Is you're yeah. saying okay, there's an edge of a table here and it looks like that, and yeah, you're yeah. stacking so without worrying about whether it's straight or not. That's just that's my edge of the table line. That's my person. This circle is the person's head, and I'm drawing a. I put a, a check mark in front of it to indicate which way his nose is going. So he's looking down at the table. That sort of rough, rough, rough sketching stuff. You kind of have to stay rough all the way through. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the head. But, you know, and this is the head where somebody who hasn't seen my drawings before could actually recognize it as a head, yeah. which is important to do. I'm wondering, a part of yeah. that is just, OK, you you have a deadline. You right. do yes. this cartoon quickly and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you do it, what? For me, it's a weekly. But still, right. you know, it was a weekly for me for most of my career. You know, or mm -hmm. it's either weekly or daily, the, yeah. you, you do it and stuff. You stop being conscious because you're just trying to meet a deadline, and mm -hmm. and just by doing it day, you know, week after week, day right, after day, right. you develop your style just because you keep you're consistently doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do, and and uh, there 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 come certain things you don't worry about in cartoons. While you do, you know, you might still be totally worried about whether or not you get, say, the the face of the person in the foreground right, because it needs to be a caricature of somebody. You know, it yeah. needs to be, say, Nancy <laughs> Pelosi, and it keeps coming out looking like, uh, you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, Jessica Walter or somebody on, uh, on television or, or, you know, on Archer, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. that just doesn't look like her. And, you you know, you're working on that and you're working on that. And meanwhile, the, there have to be half a dozen people in the background just standing around watching what's in the foreground. And you just knock those out, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, because they're not the important part. It just needs to look like a crowd of people standing in the background. So yeah. you draw this thing that maybe if you pulled one element out of it, it wouldn't look like part of a human being. But when you sort of take in the whole thing, yeah. uh, it has a whole. And again, there's I tend to see things in terms of contradictions and paradoxes. Everything has its own contradiction within it. And the contradiction of that kind of, well, here, I'm just going to put this in the background. It'll look like a crowd of people is that people will say, yeah, that's a crowd of people. And you didn't work at it. It just was kind of your shorthand for what a crowd of people looks like. And in the foreground where you labored and labored and labored over this thing, what? That looks like you were before, <laughs> you know, and, and it, is that supposed to be a person or a dog? I don't know. What, what is that? I, I, I sometimes struggle with laboring over stuff, but that's, yeah. you know, you know, I, I'm guilty of the sin where if I don't yeah. have a good idea, I just work yeah. on the drawing and I'm hoping right. that people notice the drawing and not realize that I don't have a good idea for my cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody, uh, one of the things I learned uh, over the years was that I was having 
huge trouble drawing a cartoon. I mean, really oh. huge trouble. I'm surprised because your, yeah. your stuff is so loose and, and free flowing and stuff. I, I always thought it looks easy and stuff, but well, I guess something. That making makes... it look easy was the thing. I mean, part, part one of my goals was to make it look easy, oh, which okay. is, of course, the hardest thing of all. Obviously, yeah. you're simply struggling to do it at all. Yeah. Because it's going to. And what I. Late in, later than I should have, I discovered the light box. Have you done any light box work or much light box work? Oh, you know what you I take, do now? Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go, when you take, a, you take a, a rough sketch and you put it on the box, and then you put the bl blank piece of shape, paper over it. So, okay, there's my rough underneath. I've decided where this is going to be where this is going to be in relation to everything else. Now I just need to actually draw the things, you know, yeah. put this down here, put this down there. And if I'm having trouble drawing the things, it's because I have done something wrong in the rough. I mean, I've laid it out wrong. I have put uh, the person speaking, speaking second on the wrong side of the person speaking first, you know, so I'm in and yeah. up. I'm trying, oh, well, if I put this thought balloon here and this balloon here, no, that doesn't look right, <laughs> you know, and if it doesn't, <laughs> the place to correct all that stuff is the rough. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you and stuff mm. because, um, yeah, but you because know, I'm different. I, I'm the opposite of you. I love mm. your style because I'm so right. tight, mm -hmm. and my style is so tight and yeah. stuff. And so I admire somebody who's loose. Mm. But I, I agree with you because I, I, I really work over my roughs and mm -hmm. stuff. But you know what? Yeah. I learned this from a children's illustrator I met. Is that when she gets her drawing done, mm -hmm. she goes to the scanner and she scans it onto paper. Mm -hmm. because you know I'm, I'm like you but i used to take these black carbon paper and i would right. trace it and stuff uh -huh. but when you trace it you lose the looseness of the drawing exactly the, the, the light box is much better than tracing for uh for, for that of course mm -hmm. the light box is perfect for tracing photographs and things like that if yeah, you want to yeah, yeah. every now and then i've had to do say a a drawing not necessarily a comic drawing of somebody but just a little headshot to illustrate an article those wall street journal kind of portraits Okay. And I would just, yeah, I just put somebody's, sometimes I'd do a caricature. Sometimes if I, the person struck me as having an undistinguished face or, yeah, I don't, I just don't see nothing there. Just mm -hmm. put the thing down and draw over it. Okay. And, Can you uh, give me a thing of your process then? So you, you go to the light box, you do your drawing. Well, and first of all, I just start quickly. with a piece of paper. Yeah. I, I start with my idea or my con or my subject, really. Every now and then I'll have a subject and the idea will immediately pop into my head. You know, oh, okay. I want to do something about, say, Liz Trust is, you know, that disaster short prime minister, <laughs> you know, that she just had. I have a friend who's uh, British, and I'm, I'm curious to see what his what his thoughts are on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I came up with a great, uh, it's, a, they, somebody just published a biography of her right after, uh, you know, she won the, uh, won, won the prime premiership, but before she got Boot, boot, booted out he came out you know doing her 44 days and i think i would do a new liz trust biography you know draw the book cover and uh and i'm gonna call it thatch 22 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool yeah after yeah. her hero margaret thatcher you know and uh yeah. do, a, do a catch 22 cover with liz trust on it and mm -hmm. uh you know that that that, that kind of, of joke i mean that's a case where the the pun came uh, to me first you know it's one of those yeah. things oh, oh what a great pun good thing she is failing and failing incompetent and seem to be doing everything wrong so the catch-22 joke would work there yeah, uh, yeah and imitating margaret thatcher so that works you know but sometimes it's just i need to do something about the water quality in lake gaston you know that sort of thing local issue uh yeah. poor water quality and developer development near the lake is a bad thing so, so are you doing a lot of sketches first to, to uh, get well, the idea or i i i, mean, I, I so well, sometimes to start trying words and pictures if you look at my uh, my first draft way first draft paper you you might see a lot of words written down and papers written down just things uh, you know start out by doing word and image association what are you oh, associate you're doing with? brainstorming yeah. right yeah right yeah. the brainstorming what do you associate with water uh, fishing, yeah. boats, outboard motors, uh, you know, the pollution, what are you, little germs, but, but th things about that nature. And uh, yeah. I, I remember that specifically because the, the quickest cartoon I ever drew, I mean, from getting the idea to getting it finished was something like 30 minutes. Oh, wow. and, you know, and that's because it was idea, one quick sketch to show the editor. This is back when I had an editor to show things to. Uh, 
Okay, that looks good. Draw it. Don't even, didn't have to put it in a light box. It was a. It was about our local again the Jordan Lake water supply here. Oh. Uh, bad water quality. That was the gist of it. Was Jordan Wall? Uh, we got bad water quality. We need to do something about it. Um, this wasn't know what to do. This is just bad water quality. Was sort of what it was going to say. So uh -huh. what I did was I drew a bottle. You know the ship in the bottle things you see sitting sideways with the cork on one end and it's on a little stand, and there's the <laughs> ship sitting inside the sideways bottle. Well, I drew the sideways bottle sitting on the stand, but the water was still sitting in the bottom half of the bottle. It was like you know it had tipped, but the water hadn't moved. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote under, under it Jordan Lake water sample. Yeah. And the water was sitting over there on half, sort of grayish looking sludge, sitting on one, <laughs> you know, the, the left half of the bottle and not the bottom half of the bottle. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Simple, simple gag, simple idea, communicated easily. You know, why why bust my ass drawing something that's supposed to look like a bottle when you can make a shape and you've done a bottle? Yeah. Are, are you doing number two pencils or what, what pencils? I was doing, doing? Uh, I, at that point, I was still working in ink. Oh, and, uh, I, I don't think of, I've seen your inks. So yeah. your later cartoons were they all in pencil, or did or were they just? I, I I would vary it. Sometimes when I was doing a a multi panel cartoon, like an eight panel cartoon, I would draw it in ink, uh, because ink is good. When I mean, if you've got a space this big, you know, smearing stuff around even a little bit is going to work to your disadvantage because you're smearing around the space. You know, it, it, it's hard to see something in a small space anyway. Don't make it harder for people by smudging or being in, imprecise and inexact about it. Just uh -huh. put it down there as a line drawing and fill in the lines you need. And it's not going to, if I were to take something like that and blow it up to a full cartoon size, it would look like that I feel the readers hadn't gotten their money worth, money's worth. They yeah. say, what do you do? You just did a box and drew a little face in it. But if you do eight boxes with eight little faces in them, yeah, you know, yeah. it, it's... Uh, it, it's it, and it's a way of telling the reader this is a full cartoon you don't want don't don't linger over the details because the details aren't 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 really a factor it's it's the main image is what okay. i want you to get out of this cartoon it's okay but you managed to stay mm -hmm. loose and stuff mm -hmm. that's kind of cool the way i stay loose and it was a deliberate it was a fake looseness i it 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 it, uh, it, it, it is loose but it, in a way it's cheating loose because i do it with the light box, with the tracing. Oh, okay. okay. I will do a very tight rough, and the very tight rough for one of my cartoons. Here is my entire cartoon, editorial cartoon output for the year 2015. Oh, okay. By this point, I was doing some cartoons on good old art paper, but I was oh, mostly okay. drawing on regular old typing paper. Oh, okay. And if I can flip down here and Find one of my two parters. Here is, let's see, yeah, here is, oh, here's a pen and ink one, which I did because this is an example of my pen and ink and colored pencil work. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And you can see, you can see a certain mad influence in those little scribbly drawings. I mean, that's a, that is a mad comics battleship up there on the top line. Yeah. Now, is the, is the, is the um, color, color pencil? Colored is colored pencil, regular old stuff you buy it for your kids. Oh, okay. at, or, well, I've, I've, I've now got a bunch of art supplies, but really any anything that's a colored pencil uh, can be used. I have done cartoons that, uh, oh, here's one where I, uh, here, here's an example of one of my rough roughs. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that is pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that is kind of tight, but uh, that is a, probably a second generation rough for that oh. but here is the finished cartoon oh wow yeah yeah that's nice but it is it is this stage where you should be doing all of your work yeah i mean this is where you should be figuring out okay what what is this who's talking here what's the flow of it because people read cartoons from left to right just like they read words yeah, I'm yeah, the same yeah, way. Yeah. I, I do yeah. the roughs and then I do the finals and like, mm -hmm. but I, I scan it onto Bristol board and stuff. But right. my yeah. style is a lot tighter than yours mm -hmm. and stuff. I admire your looseness. Well, it's it, again, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, an earned looseness. I mean, in the sense that I <laughs> consciously went after it. It, uh, it, it I, I, the thing I like most about it is that it, it, again, as you say, it looks very natural and very easy and very loose, but. It is a looseness that comes from, I would, 
when I would gotten a cartoon to this point, for instance, I would put the paper down and I would put it on the light box and I would say, all right, I'm going to go from this blank piece of paper to a finished cartoon in the next 40 minutes. Oh, okay. I'm just going to sit, just clock myself and do it fast because yeah. what do I need to do slowly? I know where everything is supposed to be on the piece of paper. And yeah. by this point, I hope my hand, you know, has, has figured out how to translate things. I, I remember uh, once I was, I was talking to someone early in my cartooning career about, oh, you know, the, the way cartoonists talk to each other. How do you draw hand? How do you draw somebody riding a bicycle? You know, things like <laughs> that. <laughs> Why don't you make hands hold handlebars? You know, the, the, what's uh, that? Like? And I, my first instinct was uh, not to say anything, but just to go. That's how you make a hand holding a handlebar. Yeah. It, 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 it's your brain talking to your hand without passing through your vocabulary. Yeah. It's what yeah. cartooning is. You know, it, it's seeing, reproducing or inventing or making up or just trying to get the physical representation down on paper of what you've got. But uh, it is not translating into words. I found that it's actually kind of difficult to talk coherently about cartooning while I'm cartooning. <laughs> can't do it because you know, no, 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 I, no, I understand. Yet. I understand. Talking and drawing are not the same activity. Yeah, yeah. They're you not know, even related activities. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I have. There's five more minutes for this meeting. Do you mind mm -hmm. if I make one more Zoom link? And do you mind continuing on a little? One bit? more Zoom just, link, okay? Yeah, I, I can, I can do ask just maybe one or two more questions and stuff, mm -hmm. and then we can end it early and after that. Yeah, stuff, but... that'll be great. That'll be great. Oh, and I realize I put my glasses on for this segment, but y you get reflections there, so let me take my glasses off. No, I can that's see okay. You <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, well, well, let me just make sure that I'm the same person in both both films. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in, in, the, in this five minute segment, let, let me just ask mm -hmm. one more thing uh, before we, we have to download this. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're now uh, you do uh, reviews for theater and you I, also I, teach mm -hmm. at Durham University, uh, a, a history of cartooning. How has uh, that been? Well, I, I have what I've done is not not teach at the uh, universities. I've I've done an, an adult education class through the, there's a program called uh, OLLI, the Osher Lifetime Learning Institute, which is oh. basically a a method of how you run classes for adults in the community if you're a college, you know, and you want to involve the community in what you're doing. So uh, Duke has a very good lifetime learning program for retired people, whereby oh, okay. people volunteer to teach classes in some any subjects that interest them that they want to put on the schedule that the Duke people think is worthwhile. And I ta taught a course in the history of American cartooning, oh. uh, particularly American political cartooning. It was like eight, six or eight, you know, uh, two hour long sessions talking about and showing cartoons, which oh. was basically putting them on in a slideshow and going through American history cartoon wise. Oh, okay. Which, uh, was was fun to do. I've done that at NC State, and I've done that at Duke. Oh, okay, okay. I was going to ask if it's fun, but you said it's that house. Yeah. You know, you know, you have a lot of enthusiastic students, I guess, because I mean, it sounds uh, it like was, it's a fun subject. It was. It was. You know, the the both classes I taught had fifteen to twenty people in them, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, all of them sixty five or over retired ages, which is good because you know people are going to get your references. No, <laughs> I mean, you know, I can refer to Rita Hayworth, and people will know who that is. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I was thinking more references like Eisenhower. You know, people will get things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with Steve Canyon, I guess, mm -hmm. with all of those those great comics of that time. Right? Oh yes, yeah. well, you definitely should get to Ohio State then, because uh, they have Steve Canyon. They have uh, the complete Milton Kniff collection there. That was one of the things that started the Ohio State Cartoon Library was the fact that Kniff was an Ohio State grad and James Thurber was an Ohio State grad. Oh, and they both left their papers to Ohio State. And oh. so you have two cartoonists with their papers and uh, it turned into a cartoonist thing. And more cartoonists started giving them their papers because they already had some cartooning papers. So they knew how to take care of them. And they oh, were cool. cartooning. And that's what it grew from. The whole oh, thing I didn't know that. The last 40 know. years. Yes, it's... Uh, it's grown from nothing to an entire building in forty years. Oh, okay. I, I, I yeah, I know Kniff mainly from Terry and the Pirates because mm -hmm. um, I had a neighbor. He was moving, but we became friends, right? And he, as as a you know, it's a wonderful gift. But he gave me this collection of the Terry and the Pirates, mm -hmm. these in the book form, and right. I, 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 you know, I kept thinking, gosh. 
I, I got to make sure I treat my neighbors right. <laughs> yeah. But he gave me this wonderful Terry and the Pirates collection, and I love it and stuff. I mean, I'm, the only issue I have with it is, you know, it has some of those Asian stereotypes. Oh, right. Yes, yes. But yes. other than that and stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it, I just I just love Terry. And you know, his ink work yeah. is wonderful and stuff. Oh, so. yeah. That was the, he was the the classic of the, I, I don't know what to, what to call the, the leather jacket school of illustration where, you know, you can see every gleam of shadow and sunlight shining on the corner of somebody's <laughs> sleeve when they're wearing a black jacket in the foreground yeah. kind of thing but yeah it, it, it's just a gorgeous style i'm sure there are tons of cartoonists too if they could trade the way they drew for the way milton kniff drew they'd do it yeah, yeah. like i'm one of them <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. i think i'll stick with my own thing it took me too long to develop this is a cartoon i drew nearly 40 years ago, a 1984 cartoon, back when I was doing a Hugh Haney, Herblock influenced, very tight pin style. Oh. And there you are. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Is that Sipitone? Uh Yes, it is. I was oh, using okay. that stuff constantly. Okay. Yeah, and the pain in the ass. All those little, <laughs> all those little dots there, those little gray dots of zip -a -tone. Yeah, <laughs> see, that's one of the reasons I cross hatch because you know it's a lot easier than doing the zip -a -tone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anything's easier than doing zip -a -tone, except maybe cutting amber lip. Oh, okay. <laughs> the overlaid layers. Uh, uh, oh. when I when I started cartooning, my first cartoons that were printed in the Davidson College student paper back in the '60s and '70s were actually uh, done on metal blocks. Oh, so I mean, like printing, it, right? Yeah, like printing. A wooden block with a layer of metal on top of it that was the reverse image of the cartoon for putting oh. the ink on and stamping on the paper. I mean, it was 19th century stuff. Yeah, you know, that's what John Tenniel did for Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, exactly. I, I think they that they might have been so they might have done the hand engraving. I mean, uh, photo engraving had at least come in by the time I came along. Oh, okay, uh, so, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, photo engraving was late, but that was late 19th century. I mean, they did some of Tenniel's punch cartoons were photo engraved late in his career because he lasted till 1900. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I admire his career. I mean, he was, oh. what, 50 years in Punch? 50 years in Punch. Uh, the first and I think maybe so far only cartoonist to get knighted. I'm not sure. Oh, maybe David okay. Lowe got knighted later. Yeah, yeah. Well, you I mean, you're pretty close, 41 years, right? Right. Oh, yeah. I did, I did it. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, 1977, I was in the Independent for 21 years and I was in the Durham Herald for 11 years. Oh, and okay. there were some gaps in there and one year at the Spectator magazine. But so that works out to about 32, 33 years of actual cartooning. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Is, okay. Is <laughs> <laughs> oh, I okay. think that counts. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wanted to ask, I, I think just two more questions. One of them was just about your theater reviewing. How, how mm -hmm. has that been and stuff? Um, do you have any favorite plays coming out right now? Or? I have. I have not been doing theater reviewing lately. I actually stopped doing that around 2000 and. Uh, when was it? Maybe around 2010 or 11 for The mm -hmm. Independent. But I did lots of theater reviewing for it and another magazine, The Spectator, which was also a free distribution weekly, now defunct, oh, okay. uh, in the area. And I did uh, did plays that did that for about a dozen years for oh, various okay. magazines. Okay. And Do you have any was... favorite playwrights and stuff? Or any... Oh, I've always liked Tom Stoppard, who oh, the yeah. author of Roden Grants and Guildenstern are dead. Yeah. And uh, but what's he done lately? He did uh, the, the Shores of Utopia. He did a, a, a hit yeah. play about the history of revolution in Russia and various oh, other things. I, I followed his work for years and okay. I've, always enjoyed, I've enjoyed his wit and his wordplay. He could be a cartoonist if he weren't verbal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm just learning about playwright. I had these two friends. Um, who know a lot about playwrights. So, mm -hmm. you know, before them, I, I only knew um, Neil Simon and uh, mm -hmm. Arthur Miller. But mm -hmm. through them, I learned about Tom Stoppard, right. um, August Wilson, um, mm -hmm. even like Mar Steve Martin, right? Yeah, so, right. You, yeah, you, it, I, I, you know, before then, I, I, I never really knew much about playwrights, except for uh -huh. maybe the, the two. But yeah, through my two friends, I'm, you know, like we just finished reading a play on um, my Mike Lee abigail's party and i thought oh that's yeah. kind of cool and so i'm yeah. kind of that's opened up a new world for me and stuff so yeah. do you have any other favorite playwrights besides tom stoppard well, right. stoppard well of course there's always shakespeare you can't go be out wrong with that yeah, yeah, yeah. i've done a bunch of shakespeare over the years 
Uh -huh. That has been fun. I won't claim I was good at it. Oh, uh, when oh I, was in, I forgot you act, right? Yeah, I was act, I've done acting. Yeah, I haven't okay. done it lately, but I've done it. Okay. When I was 18 years old, I played Caliban in The Tempest okay. by Shakespeare <laughs> at, uh, at, at school, you know, and uh, I think I was wrong for the part, but <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> at 18. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, were you, are you a fan of like, um, um, like Wilson or um, um, Miller or any of those guys? Yeah, I, I mean, or are I, you more I, of a comedy type person? I'm like more of a Simon? comedy person than a tragedy person for 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 plays for theater. Certainly for viewing, I'd rather I'd rather laugh than rather laugh than weep at the end oh, of the evening's okay. entertainment. But okay. uh, you know, I I just liked it because it was a live action thing. It's uh, it's happening in front of you. Oh. you know there's a lot to it and of course you yeah, do it i mean i was I, I went into reviewing because i'd been acting oh, and okay. people weren't going to pay me to act but maybe they would pay me to write reviews of things and they did not oh. like it, a little bit it was a way of making money no no but i mean like you said i remember we said in the very beginning if you if you're doing what you love then mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a reward and that's a rewarding life in and of right, itself, yeah. right? In and of itself, it's it, it, that that's a part of it. I mean, you need that for happiness. You also need, of course, the income coming in and other people around you, and if, you know. Oh yeah, the, paying the, the rent need, is also important. Yeah, paying the rent is good. Ha you know, having friends is good, but, <laughs> but doing what you want to do is 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 a big part of happiness. So, or doing something that you like doing that you think is worth doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have this one friend, he he moved to Queens and he's recommended to me uh, some of the Greek playwrights, but he likes yeah. tragedies. So I mean, oh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sort of like you, I like, I like comedies, but mm -hmm. I'm willing to try him out and stuff because um, I even, you know, for Shakespeare, I do like Hamlet. I love yes, Hamlet. Right. But that's not yeah, really a comedy. The right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, they're better. Uh, tragedies tend to be better seen than read because uh, you, you have to learn how to sort of stage a play in your head when you read them. I was interested, you mentioned uh, you were reading plays. Are you, are you doing a group reading where people read the characters? or are you uh, just... Actually, we're going to try that tonight and stuff mm -hmm. because um, um, we, we meet via Zoom and stuff. And okay. the, 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 the uh, Mike Lee, uh, that was a recommendation of our my British friend and stuff. And uh, I, I never really heard of him until my friend Rick, and I like him. It's just it's, a, it's an unusually short play and stuff. It's mm -hmm. only like around fifty pages, and um, okay. it's weird. In the back of the book, it tells you the ending of the play, which kind of spoiled the play for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we read it. And we're gonna try it today. But um, I'm not really a thespian, so I'm expecting uh, to overact a lot and stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, you will either overact or underact. That seems to be the way the way it goes. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. But you don't have any more opportunities opportunities to act I, 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 I mean of course for the last uh, two and a half years the opportunities were knocked knocked uh, knocked into a hat oh yeah, yeah i forgot about that the pandemic. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, we've already forgotten we're already forgetting covid i'm actually kind of curious this is a sideline this has nothing to do with your question about acting uh but as to just how theater and especially movies and television are going to treat this whole 2020 to 2021 22 covid period I mean, you know, I mean, don't know and stuff, but yeah. you know, I mean, I I, I do know that um, mm. you know um, during pandemics and stuff, mm. I'm wondering if like um, um, you know, like I know in the beginning of the pandemic, you saw a lot of zombie movies, right? Because right, yeah. mm. you know, and then um, uh, and then uh, so I'm wondering if you're going to have a lot of movies in isolation or a lot uh, of plays about isolation mm. and well, how do you how does that affect or like, you know with me and my 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 pandemic experiences mm. it's it's i've um i've learned the importance of family you know mm -hmm. because of uh, my in-laws my 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 dad i lost my mom on thanksgiving right or, um and about four years ago i lost pretty much um you know my wife and i we've uh we've we're, we you know we do a lot more stuff just be, yeah. um, caregiving but also mm -hmm. like uh, it's been a it's been a tough period emotionally for me because in 2019 just before the pandemic one of my closest friends Jan Lieberman passed away also on yeah. Thanksgiving mm -hmm. so Thanksgiving mm -hmm. in 2019 I lost my friend Jan and then in 2021 I on Thanksgiving I lost mm -hmm. my mom and stuff mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if um you know you were talking about that I'm wondering if for both um plays movies just family family mm -hmm. ties become more uh, of an uh 
um, uh, at the uh, end and stuff. So I think, I well, they, they could. I mean, one of the one of the gifts that COVID gave to playwrights, the hardest thing about any play, is why do these two people who don't like each other stay in the same place with each other? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, that's basically your your dramatic situation is conflict. So therefore, the question the playwright has to answer is, why are these two people who are in conflict with each other hanging around each other? Yeah. I mean, and COVID at least can get, okay, it's COVID. We're locked in the same room for the next year. But you know, know, in the screwball comedies, it used mm. to be the, the trip, right? So it happened yeah. one night. Yeah, Clark exactly. Abel yeah. and uh, mm. Claudette Colbert, yeah. they, they, they did, you know, they they um, they were amused by each other, but they're also annoyed by each other. But they mm -hmm. stayed together because of the trip. He wanted that, to get the story and she wanted to run away from the, her father, right? That is your and, classic uh, road trip movie in that it's the two people who don't like each other, you know, the conflict at the beginning, nothing in common, don't like each other's attitudes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, it happens one night does a wonderful job of just uh, presenting that gradually breaking down. I mean, the the key scene, of course, is when they're in the motel uh, where the two detectives come in to take her back. Yeah. And he's pretending, you know, and he's pretending that, uh, oh, they're just a bunch of low lives, And she suddenly joins in the pretense with him. Yeah. Because yeah, it yeah. wasn't working until that happened. And it was just Clark Gable pretending they were suspicious. And yeah. that is, I mean, that that kind of setup, that is what you need to write. I mean, there's, there's your classic dramatic situation. It's the conflict that actually appears to be a conflict, but it's actually the two of them working together against the other two characters on stage. Yeah. And yeah. that brings them together. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so a, I think with, with, with it happened one night, the conflict brings them together and, is is they both are um running away from something mm -hmm, yeah you know, i'm wondering with the, um and so with any pandemic story mm -hmm. they're running away from the pandemic that might be right. the the um the um the um you know you could have the, the the running away from the pandemic the the obvious i mean the setup that of course it presents it that presents itself presented itself in real life millions of times was the being stuck around being, yeah. being having to be with someone you do not want to be with yeah uh or made or you know did or didn't depending but there were lots of oh damn here i am with this person more than i want to be with them conflicts come up and yeah. uh then yeah, getting the, to know each other right, right. The, the old zoo story set up like william saroyan said about edward albee's the zoo story two character play on a park bench Oh, well, I, I don't, don't know, know that. I don't know that. Oh, you don't know it. Well, it's two guys who meet on a park branch, total strangers, and one of them I'll give away. I'll give away the ending here, plot and all, but it's a one act, so it's a short play. But one of the guys ends up basically committing suicide by having the other guy hold onto a knife and jabbing himself into it. Uh, oh. so, so, you know, so, summarized that way, it sounds totally implausible. And when you think about it, it is implausible, but it works in the moment. Oh, uh, okay. It's essentially a guy sort of forcing another guy to uh, kill him, uh, yeah, to yeah. kill the first guy. And uh, the question, of course, is why, do, why doesn't guy number two just leave? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're on the damn park bench. They're in the middle of the outdoors. The guy hasn't pulled out the knife until near the very end or anything. Why, do um, you, why don't you just quit talking to this obviously disturbed, crazy person and walk away? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that is basically, when you look at it, almost any dramatic conflict has to answer that question. Yeah. Okay. Why doesn't the person who doesn't want to be there leave? Yeah. And and so and that is the setting up the motive. Oh, he's going to get a million dollars if he if they're on a submarine. He can't walk out the door. He'll drown. You know, whatever. Uh, he's in, they're in jail cells. Uh, or of course, family. The reason there's so many family dramas is because you can't leave your family. I yeah. mean, you can leave the building your family's in, but you can't leave leave in yeah. the sense that you can leave a total stranger. If yeah. it's somebody in your family. And so the tie is still there, no matter how much this person is trying to break it. And there's the conflict. Oh, yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. that is where drama always starts. I mean, if you if you think you want to write a play, start with two people disagreeing about something or oh, yeah, wanting yeah. two different things and having to be around each other while they're wanting the two different things. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking also of when Harry met Sally. And stuff. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, exactly. there was a lot of conflict, but I think yeah. that resolved itself because of time. 
Time because in the, the beginning, they weren't mature enough to right. understand each other, but they went to a part mm-hmm. of their life where they both got into failing relationships. They, mm-hmm. both, they both, you know, when I was single, they used my, yeah. my friends used to tell me, you know, like timing is everything in relationships. You may mm-hmm. meet the right person, but if you're not ready for that person and stuff, then oh. then, then that person is not the right person because you're not you're you you're not the right person. You're, you're not, not the right ready. exactly. Yes, that, you know, that, you have to reach true. a point where you're. Um, where you're, um, um, I guess, mature enough, or you're ready for a relationship, for right. a relationship to work. And I think and that was when Harry met Sally, right, and mm-hmm. stuff. That is, that is, yeah, that that's all that thinking about. I mean, uh, it really passes your time. Of course, it's a factor in it happened one night. It just it happens in the course of a multi day bus trip. Yeah, where is it over one, over the yeah, where's the, yeah, yeah, over a lifetime. Yeah. But yeah, it's still the same kind of dramatic development. I mean, and of course, you spend about as much time watching when Harry met Sally as you spend watching it happened yeah. one night. From an audience standpoint, it's the same length of time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think it's it's. Um, I think both of them. Uh, I, I I love both movies and stuff, but mm-hmm. I mean, it's you know, like with with my my wife and stuff. I, I'm always laughing. I, I you know, one of the things I liked about her, she told these weird stories that made me laugh. And stuff, <laughs> right? Is- <laughs> and stuff you know that i was always amused by and stuff and that that um you know um that's um that's not always that's not always the case and stuff and that you sounds know, like a somebody. very strong foundation if you're gonna yeah. laugh with somebody uh anything is possible yeah yeah so okay so you know i i want you to be able to do other stuff during your day <laughs> <laughs> okay well i enjoy, so, really enjoy talking yeah, so let me just ask one more question. Sure. Mm-hmm. So you retired in 2018 and then stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I just retired last year to spend, you know, because to care for my my dad. Right, right. Stuff. So how has retirement been for you? It has been, uh, well, if you're a freelance cartoonist, as you seem to have been, uh, it's remarkably like working. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> except that, uh, you know, you know, all that downtime you spend when the phone doesn't ring. The only mm-hmm. difference with retirement is that you don't really worry whether the phones ring rings yeah. because you can in theory survive on yeah. social security and savings and you know the other things you you have in the back background to keep you going oh, yeah, for the rest yeah. of the years but uh the it has taken a i was born to be retired you know i have a feeling I was just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't have a job and this social security money comes in that's not enough but hey i've been getting not enough money when i was working so why not get not enough money when you're not working yeah. Uh, yeah, there's nothing like a thousand dollars a month in the savings account, just coming out uh, of the checking account, just coming in to make you feel better. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm totally, I'm materialistic and shallow. I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, um, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm that material, but yeah, I, 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 I'm different than you in the sense that I, I worked full time in a library, right. and then I did mm-hmm. the cartooning on the side. But I retired from the library because I, 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 I qualify. I'm, I'm 55 now. And mm-hmm. I, I qualified for a pension, and I did. I when my mom passed away, I really regretted not spending more time with her. So I wanted mm-hmm. to spend the time with my dad that I didn't spend yeah. with my mom and stuff. Okay. But that was my main reason for. If it wasn't for that, I might probably still be working in the library mm-hmm. and well, stuff. I know but, quite a few friends who seem to be still working, uh, in spite of the fact that they could retire. I assume in reasonable comfort. And yeah. they're reaching, you know, they're they're getting into their sixties and seventies, or getting into their sixties, and uh, but uh, I, I I recommend I retired. I, I guess technically at sixty eight, you know, when oh, I stepped okay. down uh, from the, uh, the well, the independent decided they couldn't afford me anymore, which was sad. Uh, you know, that hundred dollars a week on the cartoon, which seems kind of generous these days. You know, getting a hundred bucks a piece for a cartoon is very nice. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They told um, me they paid me a hundred for a uh, color and seventy five for black and white. I said, "Well, you're not going to get any more black and white cartoons." Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I, I wish you well. Um, well, thank you. And as you retire, and I, I hope whatever venues you go to um, mm-hmm. um, is rewarding for you. Well, I'm right now. I'm working on a book. So, uh, oh, is that a, the history of the, the history of the history of newspaper and magazine parodies? Oh, okay. I've been uh, working on for several years, and I've actually I've been working on it for since I was a child. Just like with the cartooning, I've always been a cartoonist, and I've always been a saver of old humor magazines. I saved oh. my magazines when I was a kid. You know, I saved my National Lampoons when I was in my twenties. 
Yeah, yeah. Now I'm collecting and saving old humor magazines from the past that have parodies in them I'm interested in. Oh, so cool. that is that's part of the book I'm working for. The uh, the books behind me are part of the parody parody research library up here. Oh. And here's a here's a fake issue of TV Guide. Uh, TV not not quite TV Guide. Is, is that, that, is that uh, Davis? What's his name? The guy, Mad Magazine guy, uh, something. No, Davis. this is this is a uh, this is a guy. Uh, this is a guy named James Sherman, who was a cartoon doing a takeoff on one of the regular TV guide oh, artists okay. Okay. from that period. I have another TV guide parody that does have a Jack Davis art on it that uh, was done. I oh, I don't have it to hand, but anyway, there have been many parodies of TV Guide, Time, Playboy, of course, uh, yeah. Life, Life. Uh, Reader's Digest, National Geographic. You see, you see all sorts of magazine parodies, and I have a collection of them. So I'm writing a book about them. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> when do you think it's going to come out? Um... I hope sometime. I hope I will have it done and ready to go to publication, be published next year, sometime. Mm -hmm. So late 2024, maybe early 2025. We'll just have to see. Oh, okay, but, okay. Uh, Let me know when it gets published and stuff. Okay, I, I will. Yeah. I will let the world know. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to sell, want to sell this thing. <laughs> oh, okay.